Hello, everyone, and welcome to our recovery webinar series. Hello, Sally, and welcome to you. Thank, thank you, you for... so much. Thank you. Nice to thank be with you. Thank Good you to see you today. Us. Yeah, likewise. And it, it looks like a beautiful day where you are. Um, it's pretty, yes, it's a pretty day today. We're getting into the summer here in New York, so it's yeah, good. Yeah, same, likewise here. Um, so um, thank you for joining us, everyone. This is the first of a four-part series that, um, that we're putting on and hosting at, at Rapport over the next few weeks. And uh, we're very lucky to have Sally, uh, Sally Morrison um, join us for our first um, webinar that we're hosting. And um, Sally, Sally, you have, have such an extensive background in the, in the diamond and jewelry industry and, and worked on such um, important projects um, like a diamond is forever on the on the on the marketing side, and um, so I look forward to um, spending the next hour with you and and discussing the state of the of the market in this um, strange situation that we all find ourselves in. Thank you so much. Um, so so let's, uh, firstly, how how are you, and and how how has the the lockdown been in in New York for you? Um, well, I'm very well, very healthy, happy to be, planning on staying healthy. Um, I think um, it's been a, it's been it's been quite a, an anxiety provoking time. Uh, seeing New York City shut down is 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 quite um, agitating and alarming. Um, I think initially there was an enormous amount to do, obviously, because for all of us, um, everything we'd planned prior to March sort of had to be scrapped, paused, put on hold, and we had to sort of rethink um, everything. So it was, there was a kind of strange freneticism about it. Um, but also I think this has been for, for many of us an opportunity a little bit to get off the merry-go-round for a minute and, and think. And it's been a period of, of, of kind of uh, solitude for sure, but also reflection. And I think um, that's been in some ways a gift actually. So it's a mixed, it's, I, I have mixed feelings about it. Yeah, I, I think um, both on, on a personal level and, and also a, um, a collective um, level for, uh, as an industry, I think it's, it's, uh, it's enabled us to sort of stop and you know, we've, we, we've got caught up in such a fast paced moving world that um, I, I feel like the, it's given us some time to breathe and right. sort of reassess our goals and our strategies um, right. mo moving forward. Um, and for some of us also to, to reassess our, our professional um, direction. And um, in the middle of, the, of this, um, this period, uh, De Beers announced a, a new position that you've taken on. Um, and so over the last, what's been two or three years that you've been um, the head of marketing at, at Lightbox, and you've now taken on a new role at De Beers. Um, do you want to explain to us what your what that role is and what your position, your new position entails? Sure, sure. Well, um, first of all, it's actually not a new position. I, um, I'm replacing somebody else who left um, earlier this year. Um, it's it's a public relations position um, sitting in consumer and brands and De Beers Group. Um, and I think, you know, um, De Beers for the last several years have been primarily communicating to consumers via their own brands. And I think there was a feeling that, um, there's, that there's, there are some gaps in the market, there are some places to talk directly to consumers that you want to speak to in a sort of non-branded way, just on behalf of the group. So it's a PR position really um, addressing the natural diamond conversation with consumers. Um, the focus initially, at least, is very much in the U.S. and, and you know, we'll, we'll build on that, I hope. But um, so it's, it's um, for me, it's a little bit, you know, coming back to the mothership. I mean, I had a, a fantastic time at Lightbox. Uh, I think what we have started there is, was, is fantastically interesting and creative work. And it's always so exciting as a marketer, right, to start a new brand from scratch and see it grow out of nothing. But um, there is this sense now of um, sort of familiarity of going back home <laughs> in a way. So, uh, and I think the timing is extremely, you know, difficult and unfortunate. It's very hard to start a new gig in the middle of, of, of this lockdown, but, um, but we will go forward. Well, when, forward you, when you say you feel you're, you're returning home, I'm not sure if you're, you're referring to um, the De Beers 
cooperation as such, uh, or, 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 or natural diamonds? Um, I, 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 I think very much natural diamonds. I mean, I, I, I had other careers uh, before jewelry, but my first first uh, job in jewelry was at a diamond is forever uh, in the early 2000s. So I'm sort of um, going back to that sort of natural diamond voice. And, um, you know, there's a lot to do. And I'm, and I'm excited to be part of the team doing that. Yeah, well, we we always felt that that was your your natural role, is it? Is it <laughs> in the natural, nice of you. in the natural nice diamond of you. Uh, diamond world, and and, and with, as proponents of of, the, of natural diamonds, we, we're we're happy to have you back. But it, but it's 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 kind of interest. It's been interesting to watch Lightbox um, grow, um, and and I think one of the areas that was very successful, and that uh, I hope the the industry can can draw from has been its communication with consumers you know as a, a as almost um, emerging as a um, sort of a spokes spokes um, brand for the for the lab grown sector um, i think was very effective in in talking the language of of consumers and and i think the natural diamond um, industry kind of has this is a perception of being um sort of old school luxury and um, and in inaccessibility about that so so how do you translate the language that to, that you were using um, in um, at lightbox um, to to the natural diamond world and make it more accessible for for the younger consumer well I think we really have to think about that right because because um, the, the the thoughts are the same you know that the, the natural diamonds stand for you know are symbolic of the most important deep connections that people make in their lives. So it's about taking that idea and, and I, I guess messaging it in, in or, or coding it in a way that is, um, is, is sort of accessible to the millennial consumer. Now, I think we have a lot of, a, a lot of things to think about this year. This is obviously a bizarre time, but, but, you know, that's certainly something I'm thinking about, you know, how do we connect with that, that, group of consumers coming into the market who shortly will be uh, falling in love, getting engaged, marking those moments with a piece of diamond jewelry and how do we get them into, you know, get, bring them into our world. Right. And I mean, it is a, it is a, um, I mean, that's the age old um, uh, question and, and, and symbolism that the, the natural diamond, um, and I think it's timeless. That the natural diamond, a diamond, sort of represents. Um, do Do you feel that in this period, um, people are um, ha has this um, this strange time sort of accentuated that feeling towards um, towards um, the natural diamond product, or or changed it in any way? Well, it's 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 hard to know, right? No, nobody knows because this situation is unprecedented. But when I look at um, other crises whether it's 9-11, um, 2008. Now, now in, in some ways they were similar, in some ways they were different, right? 9-11, um, I, I mean, was, a, was an incident. It occurred and almost immediately afterwards, we knew that we were now building for recovery. Um, the, the, the financial crisis was a, was a kind of uh, structural crisis in, in the financial industry. So it was a very specific thing. And then there was a sort of aftermath. This is a little bit different. And I think it's a little bit different because, um, you know, the, 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 the country being locked down, open, closed, is not really a binary thing. Um, this is going to be kind of a rolling return to business and a rolling recovery. And I think we're going to see perhaps some fits and starts in that. Um, some states you will have seen on the news have already reopened. Um, judging by the way people were behaving in some of those places and pictures, you know, not observing social distances, very close to each other on boardwalks, things like that. I would expect there will be this sort of bubble of new infections and sadly also deaths. So perhaps some of those states or counties will pull back a little bit on opening. Um, so I think this is a different crisis in that it has a kind of this long it sort of extended limbo and it's going to go on for some time. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Having said that, I think what we do know from all these previous crises is that people more than ever want to be connected with people afterwards, right? And I see it all the time. I see people who are on Zoom calls like this for work all day long and then get on a Zoom call with friends, family, loved ones at night to have 
a virtual cocktail hour or quiz night or something like that. There is this deep need for people to connect. And I think that being isolated and sheltering in place as we've all been doing since the middle of March here in the US has intensified those feelings to want a connection with other people. So I would expect as we come out of this state by state by state, pent up demand for sure for um, classic gifts of love, whether it's engagement rings, whether it's a fantastic piece of jewelry to tell the person you love that you know they're super meaningful to them. And I think we're hearing anecdotally um, stuff like that coming from some of the jewelers that are opening up. And I would expect that um, that feeling of deep need to connect with someone and kind of market with a natural, like deep, deep thing from deep in the earth, that's natural diamond. I would expect that to be a, definitely a kind of um, a movement, but I think our job as an industry is to make sure that that diamond jewelry is front of mind, right? When people do return into the market. So mm. long, long answer to a short question, but I think, you know, a bit of a work in progress as we yeah. watch this unfurl. Yeah, I mean, well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I mean there, are, there are a lot of points to, to draw from in your, in your answer. Um, the, the, first that, that, um, the first observation that I've had as, as retail is starting to open up again is that, um, that retail is being quite disciplined in enforcing that social distancing, right. Right. Um, which, uh, which, I think, um, which I think gives some confidence to, um, to consumers to engage with... Uh, with um, w with retail, um, so so I think that I that is encouraging. Um, the the uh, the other point is that you know when we talk about this um, pent up demand and and I think um, there there was uh, you know the reports that we've had about Mother's Day have been very positive for right. for the jewelry sector, which is um, which is uh, interesting and under and almost understandable as well and feeds in nicely to what you was, you were talking about about you know, wanting to express um, express your the, your emotional connection with with someone, and and certainly with with uh, you know the, a mother is is the ultimate um, in in that um relate in that um in that uh, interaction. Um, but on the other side of it, there uh, we, we there's an economic reality that um that we're facing, and um and and we're in a, a recessionary environment. In which um, people are then hesitant to, or they would prioritize um, necessity over discretionary spending. So I would imagine that that feeds into a sensitivity in our marketing of um, of a, ultimately a luxury product like um, like diamonds and, and diamond jewelry. I think that's a hugely important point. Um, I think that first of all, it's not one size fits all, right? There's a, there's a, a wide range of consumers in the United States. And I think there are people who have resources, um, who will always have resources and will still be able to afford to shop. There's also going to be this, you know, huge sort of swathe of people who have lost their jobs. We have, you know, incredibly high unemployment figures already, and that will probably get worse before it gets better. And those people um, are going to have difficulty surviving during this, right? We're going to see um, kids like giving up their apartments, moving back in with their parents. We're going to see all sorts of things we haven't seen in a long time. I do think that the um, implications for luxury are that I think, and, and I, I hear this speaking to friends in the fashion, you know, people who are working in the fashion industries or commenting on fashion, the media. I think this is going to have a profound impact on luxury because I think there needs to be a delicacy and a discretion and a kind of um, humility about people shopping. There's, there's, there's going to be this sense, a little bit of shopping shame and, oh, I can afford to do it and other people mm -hmm. can't. And I think that's going to have an impact on brands, honestly. And I think the brands that are kind of understated, restrained, discreet, not so obviously badged are probably going to do better than the other kinds of brands. And I think Actually, that's good news for what I would think of as brand diamond, because what is more classic, more simple, more elegant than a solitaire focus piece, you know, that simple, simple jewelry wardrobe. So I think we have to think about that as an industry because there is an opportunity there. But, but for sure, the sort of very conspicuous consumption is going to be a no-no, at least for the short term. And I think that's going to have 
all kinds of implications for the red carpet, for the way that celebrities dress, for the way that people um, uh, show their wealth or not in this case. So yeah, it's, it's, it, that's a big point. Um, and that, that, that was the experience um, from what I remember after the, the 2008 financial crisis, that there was this right. sort of hesitation to, to display wealth. Um, yes. and, and I think that um, that will be a factor um, moving, moving forward. Um, but, 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 you know, through this, this whole experience, the, um, we, we, and I think in any, any sort of downturn and, and, and crisis that the industry goes through and that, um, that consumerism goes through, um, it influences some changes in the way people buy and in consumer habits. And certainly the, the buzzword or, or the, one li- the one bright spot throughout, through the last you know, two to three months has been this, um, this acceleration of digital, um, uh, of digital activity, um, you know, Zoom meetings, but also shopping online. Um, I think people are becoming more accustomed to, um, to the idea of buying um, even high ticket items on, um, online and, and using digital platforms to, to buy. Um, and so is, is that a sustainable change in consumer habits? What, 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 what changes um, do you think will be long lasting that we've seen um, in this period? Um, yeah, well, I think the, the interesting thing about this crisis is it's sort of intensified changes that you've, you know, registered that are happening anyway, right? This has given velocity to things that were out there in the culture. The push towards digital, particularly mobile, is one of them. Um, and yes, I think the world is going to be fundamentally changed by this. And I don't think once we've gone there into this digital realm, we're ever going back. Um, so I think it's going to change the way that, that brands, um, clientele, to, to, to their consumers. I think we're gonna see um, innovation in kind of platforms that allow people to see and experience jewelry and fashion in a kind of dimensional way. I'm not sure yet what those platforms are, but I would expect innovation to come in the way that selling occurs. Um, I do think there's also via digital this opportunity for a kind of more personalized communication that seems more appropriate for the time, like more like OG clienteling, where where it's a sort of more one-on-one kind of relationship with your customer. Um, But we'll see. And and I think just hearing anecdotally what what a lot of um, businesses and brands have been using this time um, to kind of re-jigger um, changes they were making in their, in their kind of digital offering anyway, but doing it faster, thinking about better ways to connect with customers. So I think these crises force innovation and force it faster. And I, I'm not sure what it's going to look like at the other end, but I believe it will be fundamentally different. Um, yeah, I mean, it, the, you know, there, there are two sides to the, to the diamond industry. There's, um, there, there is this um, sort of sense that it lags behind other products in its um, adoption of, um, of, I think, um, of selling methods. Um, but it's, on the other side, we also see a lot of innovation within, throughout the pipeline, you know, but on the mining sector, certainly, um, also within the manufacturing sector. And, and um, and I think we're starting to see that now also on the, uh, from, from, the, from the jewelry brands and how they, particularly how they engage on, on social media. Um, and uh, I mean, I would imagine that social media, which, which was kind of part of, you know, was another part of a marketing strategy in the past, um, now is a central, um, a central aspect to, to any brand's um, identity. I think that's right. And I think what we've seen a lot over the last couple of months, right, is more and more brands going uh, live on Instagram. Um, I I mean, I noticed it back in uh, March when Horse and Booze did a um, a sort of a flash sale from their their studio in Santa Monica. And you were able to see right into their studio. You were able to hear from the person who designed this, who made these sunglasses, whatever it was. And I thought that was interesting. And I think more and more brands have done that. And again, that does sort of feed into this sort of this sense of uh, connectedness and intimacy that we were talking about. Like suddenly you and I can see right into each other's sitting rooms and we see like almost forensically little bits of each other's lives that we weren't aware of before. And I think we're having that experience too with the brands we follow, right? Because we're seeing the creators 
very directly in their own environments, talking about their process, how they made this piece, and so on. So I think, yes, that sort of, that sort of directness of um, particularly Instagram TV and those kinds of things are, are, are really helping brands have a much more personal relationship with their customer. And I think that's very much at the moment. I think it's a good thing. And, and I think it, it also is democratizing because even quite small brands can do that in an effective way without needing a lot of marketing budget. So that's helpful. Yeah. Where does that leave the influencer? Is, is there, um, <laughs> does that um, diminish the role of the influencer? There, there was an interesting article in um, the business of fashion writing about how brands are toning down their, um, their use of, um, of influencers. And, and maybe it feeds into what you, what you were just saying about them being able to portray a more personal um, message um, without using that third party. Um, so, so it, I think it. I mean, I think it's like everything. There's a there's a question that 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 we'll see evolve. The, you know, the answer um, to this question. But um, but do you think the the role of the in, influencer is um, going to change or diminish um, for for brands? I think it's going to change. Possibly it's going to diminish, but I don't think it's going to go away. I think it's going to be changed. I think coming out of this crisis, I mean, I was talking to, um, you know, what, one of my colleagues who's a lot younger than me, and she said, there's going to be a whole new, you know, a whole new group of TikTokers coming out of this. It's going to be a very, very different kind of person that's going to be an influencer coming out of this. And I think that's right. I don't think yet we know who those people are who are going to emerge, but um, I suspect this feeling of connectedness, intimacy, authenticity is is so critical right now that that anything that appears overtly paid or placed or not somehow true um, to the personality of, of, of the influencer is going to be very quickly sort of debunked and, and rejected by consumers so I think it's definitely going to change um, I, I, I wish I had a crystal ball um, sadly I'm just a marketing person not a magician but I, I, I don't know but I think it's going to be different <laughs> Right. Well, well, it, it will be interesting to watch because um, if, if you know if if, uh, if influencers have to sort of um, tone down their personality, which their bubbly personalities is what got them into this business, you know, it, it's um, it's uh, it, it might be a challenge. But but I think there's I think we're going to see a, a and I think we've already seen this sort of um, burst of creativity. Um, you know the the interesting sort of Instagram live streams that that um, that we've been able to just in our industry, been able to um, log on to. Um, there's really been this sort of um, uh, this uh, explosion, I think, of uh, of information and engagement between um, different parties. Um, and I hope that carries on. I, I hope that carries on. Well, I think it's also there's something that's it's, it's more considered, right? I mean that one. Um trend that was pointed out to me this weekend is there's an increasing number of, of, of like fashion and jewelry influencers. I mean, looking at th things in their own jewelry box, and this is from my grandmother, and this is from this one, and this is from that one, and doing more studied kind of considered like close up pictures of things that they actually own as opposed to things that are placed and, and you know, put in there by a brand. So I think that sort of return I think it's not really a nostalgia. I think it's a, almost a return to thinking about things that were there in the past that still remain because it's comforting to people because there's a kind of reassurance about it and a sense of, you know, this has been around for a long time, this piece in my family, and it will continue to be. And again, that sort of trend, whether it's a micro trend or it becomes something bigger, is I think something very interesting and useful for us in the natural diamond space, right? Because what is what is more timeless and Pass from generation and heirloom than a piece of diamond jewelry. So I, I think that there, there is something interesting out there because a lot of these influencers are, are having to create their own content to keep their streams live from things that they actually own as opposed to things that are being brought in by brands. And that's, right. yeah. it's, it's, there's a reflective moment in the culture for sure. Um, yeah, that, 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 that is interesting. And I think, again, it's sort of, um, it, it plays on this theme of everyone just having to calm down and and um, put into perspective what's important. And, and what's important is not the, you know, the the flashy um, 
big ticket item that, they, that, that an influencer gets to showcase on their, on their Instagram feed. But, but that, that simple jewel, piece of jewelry that they inherited from their, you yeah. know, from their, from their, their mothers or, or, or grandmother um, is what is really valuable to them. And, uh, and I, 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 again, I, I, I like that um, authenticity that's, um, that's, that, that would come through um, in the, in that, uh, on that angle. Um, the, the challenge then would be for, for brands to show, um, to show that, uh, that um, sort of those values or, or the, that, right. Um, right. you know. And right. uh, De Beers has been speaking a lot about, um, about values, you know, di- you know that the diamond industry, it, diamonds have value and they also have values. And that, and that right. seems to be the um, sort of the messaging that I've picked up from, uh, from the company in the last few months. Um, and actually it's be, I think w- without using the, that, 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 those words, um, it's been a message that it's been pushing for, for a few years now. Um, but um, the idea is to build trust for a brand. And so how, how does one go about um, uh, building trust amongst, com- amongst consumers in this in- environment? Um, well, I think, I think trust has always been important as a key part of building a brand, right? That the, 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 the consumer has to trust you. Um, I think... <sighs> I, th- I think the thing about, thing about values is, is, is super important because I think we're, you know, brands are going to be measured as based on how they behave and how they come through this crisis. And, and in terms of our brand and our industry, I mean, I, th- I think probably it was said most eloquently right by Bruce Cleaver in his letter, his open letter, A River Runs Through It, where he talks about, you know, the water gathering and the Angolan highlands and coming through into the Okavanga Delta and so on. And it's about this sense that we're all part of the same network. We're all connected by the same stream. It's moving, it's flowing, it's changing, but we're all part of the same stream and that we all have to take care of each other in that whole supply chain in, in, in order to, 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 to sort of flourish together. So, so to me, that's a really important part of, of what we all have to do now. We have to be super transparent to the consumer. We have to talk to them about how we're connected. We have to talk about, um, you know, everybody who is involved in the supply chain um, because as an industry, that's how we're going to be measured, how we take care of our own, how we live those values that we talk about and so on. Um, but I do think the, um, the, 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 one of the themes that's coming out of, one of the themes that was, you know, was certainly in the culture going into this crisis, but is, is, has been intensified by it, is that, is that interest in where things came from, that interest in, in a supply chain, that interest on whose hands touched this product before it got to us. So I think expressing that and being clear about it is, is super important. Right, I, I was gonna ask how, the, how your average diamond tear, you know, your, your individual dealer who's got an office in, in Antwerp and uh, you know, in Mumbai, um, how do they feed into that, um, into that element of trust? And I guess you answered the question in, 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 in that they're part of the supply chain and need to ensure that, um, that they know where their diamond comes from and, can, and provide those assurances. Um, I think it's traceability, transparency, transparency and right authenticity about what the product is, where it came from, who it's helping. You know, um, I, I, I just think that... Um, you know, we've been talking about this for a long time as an industry. We've gone some way towards being, you know, clear and transparent with consumers, but we have to go further because I think that need has been intensified in the consumer, in the consumer realm. Right. And similar to that shift um, to, to digitization, yeah. I, think, I think that this crisis is um, accelerating, is going yeah. to accelerate that aspect of, you know, it was a buzzword, the, the whole traceability um, story. And I think the, I agree the industry came a very long way in, in quite a, it took a while, but then in a very short period of time over the last two to three years, um, it made a very and strong strides forward in that area. But I think that this um, crisis is going to accelerate that more. And my feeling is that it's the brands that are 
are going to insist on it, that um, in sourcing their diamonds, they're going to only want to, um, yeah. you know, deal with the company that can account for their product. Right. I think that's exactly right. I think that's exactly right. Um, I mean, there, uh, there, there are all sorts of implications then as well that, um, you know, maybe we're becoming just a more streamlined and smaller industry as a result of, um, of that. But, um, but I guess it's up to individual company to, to right. play right. their cards. Um, we, we also, we speak about um, sort of, you know, the diamond industry touches various products and when we, uh, or various sectors. And uh, we mentioned, um, you know, Lightbox was um, was targeting a, a sort of a, an affordable jewelry um, jewelry audience, um, so to speak. Um, and and we have that differentiation in the in the natural diamond industry as well. There's high end and there's um, there's affordable jewelry on the natural um, diamond um, sector. How do you see those two? Or, or that that those um, two markets playing out in this uh, from this crisis will one recover um, quicker, or or or, or perhaps um, have an opportunity to gain market share in this um, in this environment? I don't. I I, I mean I, I I don't know. I think I think first of all, um, Lightbox is very much targeted at that sort of fashion. Um, fun sort of um, decorative like use, right? And, and that's a very different uh, mental and emotional mindset than a piece of natural diamond jewelry. So I think that those markets can happily coexist. I think the, the, the other question though is what's gonna happen in terms of, you know, pricing around lab grown diamonds, right? Because, um, certainly there's going to be economic pressure on a large sort of swathe of our population and provided that the prices are appealing and accessible it may be a way to um, allow some people to be in the market that couldn't be in the market at all otherwise if the prices are you know accessible enough so i think very hard to say very hard to say but i think in the short term we should assume that there are going to be some people in this country that will not have money for any disposable luxury goods at all. Right, right. Um, and, and it would take a crystal ball to, um, to predict yeah. um, yes. you know, when, yeah. when, when that um, full recovery would, um, would, would take effect. Um, I, I do want to pause for, for a minute just to, um, uh, with, with your permission, Sally, Sally um, if anyone has questions for, for you, um, if we can take some questions, uh, sure. questions towards the end there aren't many in in the in the in in the queue at the moment but um i just want to tell people that uh, it is available and uh, and if you have any questions for for sally we'll be happy to um to spend maybe a, a few minutes um or a few minutes towards the end um uh, running through some of those okay um so so, so the um as as we uh, as we come out of um, you know with all these with all these sort of trends taking place and we and we kind of focus on the um, on the uh, on on the retail market, um, but there's a whole pipeline that's affected by the you know the, the the lockdown of retail has a trickle down effect on 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 the rest of the supply chain, and so. What, what um, do you think those changes that are taking place at retail um, will have an effect on the way um, jewelers interact with the with the rest of the of the of the pipeline? I, th I think it has to. I mean, I do think that um, in the short term, right, people are not going to be traveling. They're not going to be going to trade shows. I mean, we've already seen it in the fashion industry, right? It was just announced by, by Gucci last week that they're moving from five collections a year to two. Like there's gonna be this shrinkage. And, and, and they know that even if they hold fashion shows and things like that, uh, magazines won't have the budget to send people. People might not be comfortable traveling, et cetera, et cetera. We're gonna have those same challenges in our industry, right? That there's gonna be much less travel of people going to look at new collections, to, look, to go to shows and all that. So it's gonna force us, I think, to be very inventive 
And I think, again, like we were talking earlier, it, it's going to mean that we're going to all have to develop new platforms in order to show our product in a way that people can really appreciate the detail, the fine work and so on, and, and write orders based on a digital interaction. So I think that's going to be an important change. There's going to be a little less of all those big group gatherings for the foreseeable future, maybe forever. Um, so I think that's important. I also think that maybe there's, um, I, I, I'm in, that's, that's sort of part, that's part of it. But I think also in terms of um, the smaller independent designers and brands, which is a sector I'm pretty worried about too, because I think they don't have necessarily that much, you know, financial runway in order to, to keep going through this. I think we might see some interesting sort of, um, I, I don't know, joining of forces where people perhaps share workshops and, uh, you know, and ha we have multiple designers in the same workshops or using the same artisans to sort of try and pool their resources. So a sense of sort of collaboration and little brands, little designers working together, that kind of thing. I think, I think that's going to be a, an interesting space to watch too. Doubtless, mm -hmm. doubtless, some, some brands won't make it through this, but I think what we know about crises is that they do breed innovation, right? So we're going to yeah. see new brands, new creativity, um, and brands like working in different ways. I think I was I was thinking about this this weekend a lot, where I heard that um, I heard that Jareds have been um, helping people have virtual weddings, right? right? They've been providing this service with like backdrops and you know how to how to have these platforms so you, your friends can be there with you virtually and all this thing. Now, who would have thought that a jeweler like Jared's would be, would be evolving into offering this very, very sort of specialized, personalized service to their customers. Now that's an interesting inventive response to a terrible situation, but you know, it's a very interesting offering. So I think we're gonna see all sorts of stuff like that all over the retail space. And that's, that's exciting in a way. Right. Um, yeah, it was, it was one of the, um sort of heartwarming stories I think that we that came across our um, our right. inbox that, um, that that we that we covered and um, and and I think the innovation needs to extend then also to the um, to the midstream you know your 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 suppliers of diamonds how how do they tap into these trends that are emerging at retail um, you know making their inventory available yes. um, in store you know how it's tapping in allowing retailers to tap into their virtual in inventory yep. making their their in their virtual in inventory interesting and interactive and right. um, and i think again we we were seeing um we were seeing some interesting innovation on those lines already um but i think um it, I think, and when I would speak about, I would speak to to people about that within the trade, and they would say, yeah, it's you know some retailers are on board with it, and but it's not really um, where the you know it's not it's not going to be on mass. But I think again, it's 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 a, it's another aspect that's being accelerated in this uh, in, yeah. in this environment. I completely agree. It's, um, so um, so let, let's let's take some some questions from the floor. Um, and see see what's um, come in. Um, let's let's see if there are any worthwhile. <laughs> we have a question that's uh, that asked. Uh, do you not think that the term influencer influencer itself is self indulgent? <laughs> Um, um, maybe yes, maybe. <laughs> should they rebrand the 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 profession? <laughs> well, I think it. I think it may be more that um, that we. I, I'm. This is a guess, of course, but I think it may be more that you know, being a professional influencer is going to change into it's people who have a particular skill set. Either they make incredibly beautiful images, or they're incredibly great cooks, or whatever it is they do that they become influencers based on an actual skill set rather than just because they're famous for being famous. You know what I mean? There's yeah. something a little bit old fashioned about that. Well, I, you know, I have lots of followers and I put on any little hat or makeup or whatever that I'm sent and I make it into a thing. So I think it may be more towards this sort of authenticity, people who are using social 
as, um, as a way of presenting an actual legitimate skill. And, and maybe yeah. they're great photographers or great writers or something. It's, a, it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's a different kind of influencer, I guess. Mm, and, and, that, and that's where I think we've seen um, some personalities differentiate, differentiate themselves in this crisis, you know, having engaging um, interviews on, on Instagram and using their social media platforms to um, provide a knowledge um, yep. opportunity for, for their followers. Um, and that would be an, a good example of um, of someone using a, or bringing a, a skill set rather than mm -hmm. looking good, essentially, which, um, yeah. which is often yeah. the case, I think, especially in the fashion industry. Um, let's see, do, do, you, do you see a diamond as an investment or would you categorize it in, in the luxury segment where there is no guarantee on returns over a period of time? That's a complicated question. I think, I think there are some anecdotal reports that um, people are considering, uh, particularly in the you know, bigger sizes, people are looking at large diamonds as, as investment vehicles. Personally, um, that, but that's a very small, tiny subset of the community, right? That it, it invest in diamonds as hard assets. I think of diamonds more natural diamonds more as a store of emotional value and a store of actual value in that nobody who goes in to buy an engagement ring is thinking in their mind, I'm going to buy this engagement ring because one day I might sell it. That's just not the headspace you're in when you give an important gift of love, regardless of the price. So I think of more um, the diamond as a kind of symbolic thing that holds pulls in emotional value also is a store of actual value that you plan to keep forever and one day pass down to other members of the family, children, grandchildren, whatever. So I think, um, I, I think that's a different thing. Mm. And, and again, I, uh, you know, just to build on what you've been speaking um, about throughout this, um, th this last hour, that um, I think there's the opportunity for the industry yes. um, in, in this uh, period where people are, valuing that um that sentimentality and and have a yearning for those um valuable moments um, exactly. and, and, and and have a, a perspective of where their values lie well I, th I think i think also what we saw coming out of both 9 11 and 2008 right was um people wanting fewer things but better things that that if people are going to buy anything it's going to be something very important very meaningful that has real emotional connection to them. They're not gonna buy, I think, I think this is gonna be terrible moving forward for fast fashion because I think there's gonna be a, 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 a sort of a, a push right into having less, having things that are made nicer, last forever, mean more to you. And again, for Brand Diamond, that's, that, that's a fine place to be because that's what we're all about as an industry. We're about things that last forever, things that mean something, things that you can wear every day and never, you know, lose their value. So, so yeah, I think, I think we, we have to focus on that as an opportunity. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the argue, I, I agree with you. Um, the, the, the argument is that there is also a movement in these, in, 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 in times of crisis towards um, bargain, to, to bargain hunting, you know, people looking for, um, affordable items, um, which, um, but, but maybe in the, in the jewelry sector that would, you know, maybe we need to differentiate between, um, you know, affordable clothing and, uh, and, and, and a nice piece of jewelry, you know, that, um, I, um, yeah, I, I don't know what you think of that, that if there, if there's maybe an opportunity then also for, and this is one of the questions that, that has come through that, um, you know, do, do we think that some um, lab grown will eat some market share from, 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 from natural diamonds? Um, lab grown being the sort of more affordable product um, in, a, in, a, in a time when people have, have lower budgets. I, I, I think not for those meaningful emotional gifts of love, because I think that coming through this crisis, we have even more respect for the natural world, right? Um, again, another trend that has been accelerated 
by this crisis. Like we knew we were traveling too much. We knew we were polluting too much. We, we knew we were consuming too much. This crisis has forced us to stop. We can't travel. We can't consume all these things. We, we maybe can't get the vegetables in the supermarket that we're used to getting every day because our supply chain is disrupted, you know, and it's made us really, really think and understand that. And I think respect the natural world even more. So I would expect people to come out of this with an enhanced um, desire, respect for a natural, a naturally occurring miracle of the earth. And I mm -hmm. think that um, particularly for either proposing or, or maybe I, 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 I hear all the time about these husbands who suddenly are seeing because they're at home all day long with their wives, exactly what their wives have to do every day in order to keep it all rolling. They have to do the homeschool on the Zoom. They have to do all the meals. They have to do all the laundry and probably they're doing their own virtual work from home too, right? I yeah. think there is a sense of people recognizing and acknowledging what their partners go through to keep their worlds in line. So I would expect people to come out of this with a, with, um, a, a stronger desire to acknowledge with a gift of love what that means to them, that those small acts of heroism that to keep their world going every day. So I think that's something you wouldn't sort of uh, celebrate with a product that came out of a factory. That to me is about something that comes from the natural world. Um, and we'll see, but, but, but I, I, I think um, we're just moving into a much more considered, thoughtful moment where, where things that are just manufactured are going to be less desirable than things that have a, a profound meaning. Mm. And, and I think, um, I mean, I, I love what you said about, um, about having more sensitivity towards the environment. And, um, and again, have, people are, are using this period to, to pause and, um, and, and certainly, you know, without airplanes flying over your head, there's less pollution and you're hearing, you, you're hearing birds tweet, <laughs> you yep. know, more. Yep. Um, and, um, and I think that's been, that, that has, that, that again, over the last like, year or two or three has um, etched its way into the industry's messaging. Um, and we're seeing, you know, we know De Beers is very involved in um, in environmental issues today. Yeah. El Rosa is also doing, um, uh, has, a, has a number of products. And uh, particularly, I think, from the mining industry, that um, that, that I, I mean, I guess it's it's just another avenue to, to display a brand's values. I, I think that's right. I think that's right. I, mean, I was very struck. Um, I don't know if you know, I, I wrote it down because I loved it so much. Alessandro Michel at Gucci um, wrote in one of his diaries last week, we all turned out to be so small. And for me, that was like the, 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 perfect, um, the perfect encapsulation of this, like that we're all little and we actually, the world and the environment and the globe is bigger and more powerful than us. And we've been stopped in our tracks. And, and I think, I think we're all touched by that, right? We're all touched by that, you know, hearing the birds differently, um, you know, underst understanding, you know, that, 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 that there are now fish in the lagoon and in, in Venice, that people in India can see the Himalaya. I mean, how incredible, but we were doing all this to the world ourselves and the world has basically stopped us in our tracks. And so I think the messaging about how we contribute back to communities, how we how we take care of environments in the communities where we operate, uh, the things we're doing for our people, um, all very powerful, positive messaging for the diamond sector yeah. right now, up yeah. and down the supply chain, you know, because there's a whole raft of things that we are contributing, but we've perhaps not done such a great job in the past of talking about. Right. Right. Um, I agree. And it, uh, you, that, that quote was, uh, was absolutely beautiful. Um, it, it, that, so that it's, it encapsulates, I think, how we all feel. Yeah. Um, you know, that um, suddenly, you know, even in our interactions with other people, it's, it's not about me, actually. It's, it's about how I relate to other people. And, um, yeah. Um, but um, uh, the, the, other, the other thought that, um, that crossed my mind while you were talking is that birds are actually reclaiming what it means to tweet, you know, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, we can yeah. uh, um, put a bit of perspective in. Um, the, 
Uh, we, we have a question that's quite interesting, and it, it says as follows that uh, diamonds and fashion, um, do they have a chance to be close to each other? Um, or is diamond um, a, or is, is, or is a diamond forever classical? Um, you know, how, how, how does the classical diamond fit into, into fashion and interact with the, the, the world of fashion? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. To me, in the short term, as we discussed a little bit earlier, I think there is going to be a move to a kind of discreetness, understatedness, restraint um, aesthetically around fashion brands and the way that, 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 that um, influential people dress themselves particularly. I also think that that's going to be a kind of issue for the red carpet. And it's going to be very interesting when there are carpets again, even if they're virtual carpets, how stylists are going to approach that, right? Because I suspect there's going to be some um, sort of uncomfortableness about um, promoting new collections, new brands, whether it's jewelry or clothes. And I would expect perhaps stylists maybe um, to shop their clients' closets or to go into um, vintage pieces, things like that. In terms of jewelry, maybe that means they will put their clients in jewelry they own, as opposed to jewelry that's put on them um, by a brand. So I think in the short term, I see diamonds sitting in that very classical, um, restrained, understated, um, non-showy space. And I, and, I, and I think particularly in terms of retail, that means I think there'll be an interest in very classic solitaire focus pieces, you know, diamond solitaire necklaces, studs, um, tennis braces, uh, like that basic diamond wardrobe that we all aspire to own before we have anything else. And I actually, based, I, I think that's not such bad news either, by the way, because I think with very few open to buy dollars, most retailers have that product in stock, right? It's those simple yeah. classic things. And I think that's where we're going to live in the short term. Of course, there are going to be inventive things done with diamond jewelry because coming out of this, there's going to be a very strong, I think, creative energy, particularly from the younger generation. But I think that's going to take a little bit more time. So I think there's, there's a kind of a, a short term and there's a midterm. But for now, I would say I, I, I think that, that um, classicism and restraint is going to be where it's at amongst people who have resource. Mm. Which, which I think feeds into this, um, this next question. And maybe we'll take a, a, another two or three questions um, before we close out. Um, but um, uh, this person asks, how do you see the secondhand or previously owned luxury jewelry market during this period? Again, um, I, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I would expect the interest in vintage and beautifully crafted things from the past and um, things that have enduring value to be very much of interest to consumers. Um, I think, you know, that this it's, I think it's about a connection to a maker, right? The hand of the maker and something that's lasted through time, something that's maybe hand made, hand wrought, fine finishing, all those kinds of things. So I would think there would be a strong interest in that bit of the sector. And in times of, um, in difficult times, we, we, we tend to also see a, um, a um, more movement in the secondhand market, um, I, I think. And that's, that's, that's something that I would expect that, um, that you would have people maybe selling their jewellery um, and, and the sort of stronger activity in the second in the second hand market. I didn't realize you're talking about selling. I was thinking you more about buying. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, unfortunately, true, right? What 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 we what we've seen in other moments of economic downturn is people are forced um, to to sell their jewelry and uh, uh, particularly gold jewelry, actually. But um, we'll 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 see. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay, let's see if um, we can take one more, one or two more. Um, so it may be a bit of a difficult question uh, or, 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 or quite broad, <laughs> um, but how should small businesses replan their marketing budget, which has now um, substantially been reduced? Um, 
I think I would double down on more personalized communication. So maybe segmented email, um, maybe um, more sort of old school clienteling, calling clients on the telephone, FaceTiming them, saying I've got this beautiful new thing in, uh, remembering their birthday, remembering their anniversary, reaching out personally, having sales associates connect directly with their clients. I would be more focused on um, more personalized things. And, and I think that, um, you know, I think people often sort of view um, using, you know, engaging in social media and their marketing and is sort of um, a big step for them. But, it, but I think it's actually quite cost effective. It doesn't take yeah. a lot to be active Stop. on Instagram, yeah. to, you know, to, to at least start that, um, that, uh, that, that, that um, engagement with, uh, with consumers. Um, a few people are asking about um, about the Diamond Producers Association, and um, so, so in your new role, Sally, um, will you have an engagement with the with the DPA? Um, would the De Beers marketing strategy sort of overlap with the um, with the DPA uh, messaging? Um, bearing in mind, of course, we, we know that the DPA is is going to announce um, a rebranding. Um, next week, and uh, and actually, if I may plug our next webinar, and um, that David that David Ke Kelly will be our guest um, next Tuesday. So we, we look forward to speaking to him about the new campaign. Um, but how do you sort of view this um, generic component of um, marketing on behalf of the diamond industry? I think it's critically important. I mean, I think the DPA is charged right with driving diamond demand and the diamond voice generically across all sectors. So I'm extremely excited to see their unveiling and their rebranding. It's obviously an organization very close to my heart because I worked there in the past and I think they have a hugely important role to lead us all forward through this. Um, and I, I think we as De Beers want to be, um, you know, a very sort of active contributor to that. Clearly we, we, we're an investor in, in that. And I hope that we will also benefit from it very much because um, we're, we're counting on, you know, them to build that generic voice. So I, I think there is very important, very, very important. Right. And, and having worked on a diamond is forever when it was um, the voice and, and sort of the, the, the tagline for the industry on, on behalf of De Beers. Um, that, that would, um, you know, we've, we saw how effective that can be, that can be and, and how important it is to the industry to um, sort of build a, build a, um, a centralized messaging that everyone can feed off of. Exactly. It's, it, it's the most single important thing. I think a lot for us as an industry is riding on it and, and I'm very much looking forward to supporting it uh, wherever we can. Me too. I'm excited to see what, um, what changes they uh, yeah. they bring forward? Yeah. It's, uh, I agree. It's, uh, I agree. Um, you know, we, we heard we heard so much about the supply side. Naturally, when 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 demand drops, and um, there's a response on the on the supply side, and um, you know, with the mining companies having to draw back production and um, and manufacturers um, being affected and and curbing their rough um, intake, and um, but they then in a crisis comes a time when it becomes appropriate to talk about marketing again and to think about what the appropriate marketing is. And I'm, I'm thankful that we're approaching that time now, you know, yeah. that, um, that retail is starting to open up cautiously and that we can think of a sensitive way to market, um, market our industry and our, and our product. Um, so uh, let's, let's leave with one last question and, um, and, uh, uh, thank you so much for giving your time and and your insight. It's it's so valuable to us. And um, what is your message to the diamond industry as we start to embark on this new world of um, post or coronavirus era um, consumerism? I, I guess I would say that just based on to sum up our whole conversation, I think there are opportunities right now. I think there are opportunities. Uh, particularly for classic diamond jewelry. We're going to go across the summer. The country will start to, to reopen here in the, in the U.S. We will expect 
uh, an uptick in demand. Certainly that's what they're seeing in China and they're a little ahead of us there. Um, so I think we need to go full force and be focused on Q4, which traditionally is such an important time for us as an industry anyway. One thing I think that is, um, a number of people have mentioned this to me and I think it's totally true. This is a year where certainly travel budgets are going to be potentially available, right? That, that people are not gonna necessarily do that ski holiday around Thanksgiving. They're not gonna go, they're not gonna get on an airplane. They're certainly not traveling this summer in most cases and their children are not going to camp. So travel has historically been a huge competitor for us in the jewelry industry. I think this is a time where we have to think there are gonna be available dollars there. Those plans have been put on hold. Now could not be a better time than to market and propose our product as something to mark this holiday season. So I, I would, in the short term, totally double down on the classics. I think there's nothing more appropriate and discreet and symbolic of a kind of important emotional moment than a piece of diamond jewelry. And I think what we know is that, that a diamond can say things that words can't. And at this moment, we all need to like connect with people with those powerful symbols. So I think we, we focus on Q4. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and I think um, it's going to, you know, it's, we know that it's, uh, we, we're, we're still in the middle of um, a difficult period. Um, but I think there will be um, opportunity for, for growth um, at, at some point. And, and I think around the holidays, there will be that opportunity for consumers to um, express or, or to spend a bit more on um, on gifting and uh, and expressing that uh, that emotion that uh, you've spoken so eloquently about. Um, but uh, thank you so much for, oh, for pleasure. joining us. Nice to talk to you. Likewise, and best of luck in your new position. Thank in, you in so much. The position that's new for you. I, I yes, the new position. Position for me. Exactly. Um, in the meantime, you're still at Lightbox, I understand. That, uh, I'm just I'm going. just transitioning out of Lightbox for the next couple of weeks, and uh, hopefully there will be someone to be replace me there very soon. Um, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, stay safe and, and healthy, Sally, and it was great talking to you. You Thanks, too. Sally. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.